for this second lecture is the Doctrine of Justification in Early Wesley. The Doctrine of Justification is nearly always associated with the post-1738 Wesley by scholars and historians. Of course, the reason is simple. In 1738, Wesley became an evangelical by adopting the Protestant Reformation's message of justification by faith alone. It was this gospel message that informed Wesley's conversion to Aldersgate and became a staple in his evangelical preaching and teaching from that point forward. This is evident in Wesley's writings. What has not received sufficient attention is that Wesley already had a doctrine of justification before 1738. As we'll see, he first learned about justification as a child and youth, and it was an essential part of his soteriology during his time at Oxford and Georgia. In this lecture, we will explore the early Wesley's doctrine of justification, identifying primary sources and explaining its central tenets. Although space in this lecture does not allow for a study of its influence on his doctrine of righteousness beyond 1738, the audience, students of Wesley, will nevertheless see connections. The place to begin is with Wesley's Anglican context. So let's begin. The religious milieu of Wesley's upbringing was in the high church tradition of the Church of England. Both of his parents, Samuel and Susanna, conformed from descent to the Church of England during the late 17th century Anglican renewal and became devout high churchmen in their convictions. Wesley acknowledged his high church upbringing in later years to the Earl of Dartmouth. I am a high churchman, he says, the son of a high churchman, bred up from my childhood in the highest notions of passive obedience and non-resistance. Passive obedience and non-resistance was two features of high churchmanship back then that he's pointing out to the Earl. On another occasion, Wesley explained he had been raised in the high church tradition to love and reverence the scriptures, the church fathers, and the Church of England, including all her doctrines and liturgy. In keeping with the historic faith of the Church Catholic that reached back to Augustine, the Church of England taught that justifying and regenerating grace is granted in the sacrament of baptism. The baptismal liturgy for infants in the Book of Common Prayer defined the sacrament as, quote, the mystical washing away of sin to sanctify with the Holy Ghost that he or she being delivered from by wrath may be received into the ark of Christ's church. After the child was baptized, the priest would declare that the child is regenerate and grafted into the body of Christ's church and has become God's own child by adoption. The same language and themes are found in the baptismal, language, baptismal liturgy for those of riper years, meaning adults. So the established church taught that the gifts of justification new birth, adoption, union with Christ are initially granted in the sacrament of baptism. For high church Anglicans, like the Wesleys, justification involved two moments, two distinct moments in the Christian journey. The first one is the initial gift of forgiveness at baptism, and the second one is a public decoration at the last judgment. In between initial and final justification was the work of regeneration and sanctification. Known as the doctrine of double justification, because there's two moments of justification, the high church order salutis could be outlined as follows. Initial justification at baptism, then there's the process of working out of sanctification in a person's life, there's final justification at the last judgment, and then eternal glory in the kingdom. In this order, this ordo, salutis, faith and good works were understood not as accruing merit, but as fulfilling conditions of gospel salvation, with assurance grounded on a rational deduction of fulfilling these conditions. It was in reference to final justification that high church Anglicans claimed that sanctification precedes justification. Jeffrey Chamberlain explains the rationale. Since justification is not completed until it is determined that a person has met the conditions of faith and works, 
it could be said that sanctification preceded justification. That is, a person has to be made holy before his, justifica his justification is complete and final. Since the sacrament of communion confers sanctifying grace to believers, it too was seen by high churchmen as essential to maintain a state of justification in this life. So in summary, Anglican high church soteriology in the 18th century held a sacramental view of justification in the Christian life that was basically Augustinian. And it was this viewpoint that was instilled in the young Wesley by his parents and his education at the Charterhouse and in Oxford. Taylor and Law Beginning in 1725, Wesley's interest turned to the Anglican holy living tradition and this produced a life-altering spiritual awakening in his life. Of the many authors he read, two stand out as representative and influential to his doctrine of justification, Jeremy Taylor and William Law. Both men were Anglican high churchmen, yet each stressed a distinct emphasis that supplied important concepts to Wesley's early understanding of righteousness. Wesley read several of Taylor's writings, but the one that engaged his attention the most was the rule and exercises of holy living and holy dying. The book is best described as a discipleship manual in which Taylor advocates a rule and method approach to the Christian life. Richard Heitzrader explains that Wesley adopted this distinctive approach during his spiritual awakening in 1725, and over the next several years, this method became the defining mark of Oxford Methodism. Taylor's gospel stressed evangelical repentance, holy living, the conditionality of salvation within an Anglican order of salvation. One of Taylor's fullest statements of justification in holy living and holy dying is found in the section on repentance. God changes also upon man's repentance, that he alters his decrees, revokes his sentence, cancels the bills of accusation, and throws the records of shame and sorrow from the court of heaven, lifts up the sinner from the grave to life, from his prison to the throne, from hell and the guilt of eternal torture to heaven, and to a title of never, never ceasing felicities or blessings. This quotation shows that Taylor understood justification to include a cluster of blessings, with the central idea that it alters a person's standing before God. However, contrary to standard reform theology, he did not believe these blessings were fully completed in this life. As did other high church Anglicans, Taylor was Arminian and held a progressive view of repentance in the Christian life. Repentance begins in baptism, continues through life, and is finished at death. In other words, once again, we see the Anglican order of salvation at work here. Since repentance is a condition for forgiveness and is progressive through life, Taylor concluded that pardon is also partial and progressive through life. To illustrate, he pointed to Israel, when time and again God forgave their sin of idolatry. In each instance, forgiveness applied to past commissions of idolatry. When Israel committed adultery again, God visited upon them punishment that required fresh pardon. In this way, evangelical forgiveness remains partial and progressive through life. God forgives when sin is forsaken, but future sin requires future pardon. A second related point is that the gift of pardon plays an essential role in the Christian sanctification. Taylor held that through the gift of pardon, God effectually imparts sanctifying grace and deliverance from sin. Evangelical forgiveness, therefore, does not consist merely of a, quote, secret sentence, a word, or a record, as the Calvinists taught with their views of unconditional election. Instead, it affects a state of change that ultimately prepares a Christian for final justification. In the end, Taylor presented a high church Arminian alternative to the Puritan view that justification is complete and finished at the beginning of the Christian life. 
Taylor's explanation of justification had an immense influence on Wesley. Holy living, holy dying was instrumental to Wesley's spiritual awakening in 1725, and Taylor's method of rule and exercise set the direction for Wesley's religious pursuits and the Oxford Methodist program of holy living. Initially, Wesley questioned Taylor's concept of progressive pardon. Having grown up believing that through the sacrament of communion, his preceding sins were ipso facto forgiven. On this point, he misunderstood Taylor, who also believed the sacrament confers pardon and sanctifying grace. But by 1730, Wesley would commend Taylor's association of forgiveness with sanctification and confess it represented one of the clearest explanations of pardon he had come across. Holy living was now firmly wedded to the early Wesley's doctrine of justification. From his diary, we learn that Wesley was reading William Law's A Serious Call to a Holy and Devout Life by December 1730. Two years later, he perused Law's prior work, A Practical Treatise Upon Christian Perfection. Law's influence on Wesley was immense. Over the next several years, to the point that Wesley sought his counsel on spiritual matters and even tailored his ministry after Law's principles. One of those principles was to subsume justification in the new birth and sanctification and to focus solely on a believer's inward renewal and in holiness. Law considered Christ's death as a, quote, full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice that ended the Old Testament sacrificial system and fully reconciles God to acceptance upon the terms of the New Covenant. What those terms are is seen in Law's comments on the Baptismal Covenant. Quoting Law here, No sooner are we baptized, but we are to consider ourselves as new and holy persons that are entered upon a new state of things, that are devoted to God, and have renounced all to be fellow heirs with Christ and members of His Kingdom. According to law, the Christian life does not consist merely of performing religious duties, going to church, taking the sacraments, saying your prayers, but involves a life that is wholly devoted to God. This led to his next point, and this is very important. Law writes, Whenever we yield ourselves up to the pleasures, profits, and the honors of this life, that we turn apostates break our covenant with God and go back on the express conditions on which we were admitted by baptism into the communion of Christ's church. With this one statement, Law declared baptized Christians to have lost their salvation when they turned to worldly pleasures. To be saved, these nominal believers, these believers in name only, had to renew their baptismal vow of full devotion evidenced by self-denial and renunciation of the world. This rededication or single attention, Law called the new birth, becoming a new creature in Christ, and a conversion of the heart to God. Those converted as adults who rededicate themselves to God, fully devote themselves, are born again, again, were true Christians, pardoned and accepted and on the path of renewal in the image of God. Law's impact on Wesley can be seen in two areas. First, Law connects justification and the new birth to conversion, adult conversion. As a result, Wesley reinterpreted his spiritual journey to assert that he had sinned away his baptismal regeneration as a child. In fact, he says it's by age 10 he had lost it. He now considered his spiritual awakening in 1725 as his conversion and the moment of his justification and new birth. Although Wesley's views of gospel justification would change again in 1738, Law's influence was instrumental in preparing him for the Moravian message of free grace. Second, Law led Wesley to subsume justification in the new birth and sanctification. Years later, Wesley recounted that during his time at Oxford, he was confounded. Um, that he confounded justification with sanctification and held confused notions about forgiveness. 
Law's gospel of full devotion inspired Wesley to see inward holiness as the one thing needful. Therefore, gaining inward righteousness practically absorbed all his attention, as is evident in his Oxford sermons. So we now return to the sermons. The sermons serve as a primary source for the early Wesley's theology of salvation and the Christian life. The bicentennial edition contains 17 sermons from the 12 year span from 1725 to 1737. In these sermons, the focal point of righteousness is inward, on developing a godly and holy character, and not on a, the objective righteousness of justification. This concentrated interest on the interior work of the Spirit reflects the impact of holy living divines like Taylor and especially William Law. Even though Wesley's focus in these sermons is on inward righteousness, in one sermon, he did express his current doctrine of justification. In the landmark sermon, The Circumcision of the Heart, 1733, Wesley distinguished between present and final justification in the preamble. In this life, he says, true follower of Christ is in the state of acceptance with God. Notice the present tense, is, conveys that the believer is already in a right standing with God. That is, they are already in a state of acceptance. Wesley then explains in the sermon that a believer's acceptance is not conditioned on anything external like baptism or any other outward form, or, but on a right state of the soul with God. Law's influence is evident in these comments. Wesley proceeds to explain in section 1 that it is by faith that believers see their calling is to glorify God by offering themselves entirely unto God as those that are alive from the dead. Thus believers are born of God and now do, through God's grace, the things which are acceptable in the sight. Moreover, faith does not leave the Christian hopeless, for it gives a joyous prospect of that crown of glory which is reserved in heaven. So faith and hope lead to love in which every affection, thought, and word, and work terminates in God, who is the sole end as well as source of the Christian's being. Wesley here links present justification, the believer's current acceptance, to faith, assurance, new birth, and holy living. Since saving faith produces a holy life, a life that is acceptable to God, he could say that believers are justified by faith. In this way, Wesley expressed a mainstream, high church understanding of justification by faith. After discussing present justification in the preamble, Wesley turns to final justification. The last judgment is when the true follower of Christ will receive God's public, there's a key word, at the final judgment it's going to be God's public declaration of approval. Quoting Matthew 25, 23, well done, good and faithful servant. Wesley encouraged believers to be content and to wait for thy applause till the day of thy Lord's appearing, when everyone receives their praise from God before the great assembly of men and angels. Here, typical Anglican expressions and concepts are employed to describe final justification. As Scripture abundantly teaches, this final decoration by God is conditioned upon good works as well as on faith. Towards the end of the sermon, Wesley repeated the Anglican position that faith is the foundation of good works, and that the Holy Spirit is the inspirer and perfecter both of our faith and works. Insightful at this point is Wesley's appeal to the economic trinity to explain his doctrine of justification. Throughout the sermon, the Father is the source and end of the redemption. The Son purchases redemption by His atoning death, and the Spirit applies the benefits of redemption to believers for their renewal in the divine image. So central was this Trinitarian soteriology to Wesley's early theological vision that it left an indelible mark on his doctrine of justification. To explain this further, we turn to his devotional writings, a collection of forms of prayer. Around 1730, Wesley began to compile prayers and psalms for personal use in a notebook, which was the common practice in Anglican piety. 
The Psalms came from the Book of Common Prayer and the prayers from Anglican divines. The prayer manual became a primary source for Wesley's first publication in 1733, titled, A Collection of Forms of Prayer for Every Day in the Week. The collection was designed for his students and fellow Oxford Methodists, and over the years, nine editions were produced, so he saw an enduring value to the work. One feature that stands out in the collection is how the economic trinity affects our restoration in the Imago Dei, including our justification before God. The opening prayer of the collection sets the Trinitarian agenda for the entire work. Wesley writes, Glory be to thee, O holy undivided Trinity, for jointly concurring in the great work of our redemption and restoring us again to the glorious liberty of the sons of God. Here Wesley suggests there is a perichoretic coactivity in that the three divine persons interpenetrate each other's divine activity in our renewal. Although our redemption is the work of the one undivided trinity, the collection follows the pattern set by the apostles and Nicene creeds and assigns roles to the three divine persons. Father is creator, Son is redeemer, and Holy Spirit is sanctifier. A closer look at these roles offers insights into the early Wesley's doctrine of justification. So we begin with the Father. As a sovereign God, the Father provides for our justification. He also serves as the primary authority in the pardon of sin. For nearly every petition for forgiveness in the collection is addressed to the Father. Moreover, this authority pertains to final justification, for, for it will be the Father who grants merciful acceptance in the last day through the merits of thy blessed Son. That day will certainly be dreadful, because it's final judgment. Yet believers will be shown mercy by the Father through the mediation and satisfaction of thy blessed Son, Jesus Christ. So within the economic trinity, it is the prerogative of the Father to pardon sin, and at the final judgment to grant access into the everlasting kingdom. That's the Father's role. Whereas the cross receives little attention in Wesley's sermons, the atonement emerges as central to his doctrine of justification in the collection and manuscript prayer manual. The Son offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice. Notice the exact same quotation as William Law gave. De same definition. For the sins of the whole world, whereby he merited for his people mercy, forgiveness, acceptance, and entrance into the eternal kingdom. In the prayer manual, that's Wesley's private notebook, Wesley repeatedly refers to the cross in substitutionary terms that continuously procures or merits pardon and sanctifying grace through the sacrament of communion. Presupposed in these comments is the Anglican doctrine of double justification. In the, pri in the Friday prayer morning prayers, Wesley opens the meditation on the Redeemer's life and passion by, by first offering praise to his divine personage. O Savior, says Wesley, O Savior of the world, God of God, light of light, thou art the brightness of thy Father's glory and the express image of his person. Be thou my light and peace. By beginning with Christ's deity before contemplating the depths of his passion, Wesley suggests that the sufficiency of the atonement is grounded on the intrinsic worth of the Son's divine person. In other words, the merit and value of Christ's passion for our justification rests on who He is that poured out His life for our redemption. The same prayer proceeds to a deeper consideration of the believer's death to sin. In the Wednesday prayer on mortification, Wesley includes a penetrating meditation on what it means to be planted together with thee in the likeness of thy death in order to be raised in the likeness of thy resurrection. Participation in Christ's death and resurrection puts to death, puts to death the old life 
and imparts new life to, in Christ. The Holy Spirit, as the Spirit of Christ's passion and resurrection, enables believers to utterly destroy the whole body of sin so that they no longer live to the desires of man and instead pursue the will of God. The Spirit of Christ within believers enable them to declare, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Wesley's statements about the believer's union with Christ signify that he rejected any notion of works righteousness. Instead, his soteriology was rooted in the Augustinian paradigm of salvation as a lifelong journey enabled by divine grace. Richard Heitzenrader summarized this aspect of Wesley's soteriology during his Oxford period. Salvation is not a momentary event, but involves a process of restoration and becoming holy, of cultivating the love of God in such a way as to draw closer to the goal of having, having the mind of Christ. The emphasis of the Christian life then was on sanctification as one pressed on with the assistance of God's grace toward perfection and love and final justification. Yet there is more in the collection to consider about Wesley's doctrine of justification. As did other Anglican divines, he appealed to Romans 4.25 that links the believer's justification to Christ's resurrection. By ascending to the Father's right hand, the Son perpetually intercedes to bring forgiveness and other covenant blessings to his people. Wesley explains that Christ's advocacy is significant in two ways. First, as our merciful high priest, believers can be assured of their pardon and acceptance by God. Second, and related to the first point, Christ's exaltation assures his people of his presence in the sacrament of communion. As a result, in the holy meal, Christ dwells in his people and they in him as we, as we partake of his body and his blood. From this union, believers receive the refreshing graces of forgiveness and inward strength, which in turn furthers their sanctification and renewal in the image of God. The sacrament therefore serves as a primary means for the maintenance of of a state of justification for the Christian. For this reason, Wesley enjoined upon his believed followers to practice frequent communion and even wrote a sermon at the time to encourage the practice. Turning to the Holy Spirit, whereas the Father's role is to pardon sin and grant access to the eternal kingdom, and the Son's role is to purchase redemption by his atonement and to perpetually plead his people's cause before the Father, the Holy Spirit's role is to apply these redemptive benefits to the lives of God's people. Hence, all three persons of the Holy, Undivided Trinity are involved in our justification, which begins in baptism, continues in our sanctification, and is completed at the Last Judgment. Once again, the Anglican Ordo Salutis. Fundamental to the Spirit's role is His procession from the Father and the Son, or in theology we call the filioque. In the collection, Wesley used a variety of verbs to describe the Spirit's salvific activity. The Spirit enables, inspires, assists, breathes, guides, aids. The Spirit comforts, assures, unifies, and sanctifies. These internal actions bring the objective work of the Father and the Son to fruition in the lives of God's people. As the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit effectually applies the justifying, redemptive work of the Father and the Son to the hearts of believers, effecting their recovery in the divine image. Thus, the Spirit's role in the perichoretic coactivity of the economic trinity is to internalize the promises and benefits of the new covenant established by the Father and mediated by the Son. Closing thoughts. More space has been devoted to the collection because it spells out in sufficient detail the richness of Wesley's early doctrine of justification. Wesley's gospel is not shallow. 
nor did he consider salvation merited by good works. Firmly anchored in the Anglican High Church tradition and his doctrine of double justification, Wesley held that grace empowers a believer's renewal in righteousness and love with eternal fellowship and happiness in God as a terminus ad quem, the final goal of the renewal process. Early in life, Wesley was nurtured in the Anglican view of sacramental justification that reached back to Augustine. This sacramental view held that there are two distinct moments of justification in the believer's spiritual journey. There's initial justification at baptism and there's final justification at the last judgment. In between these two moments, the, the believer's acceptance is maintained by the sacrament of communion, where they receive fresh grace as they partake of the holy meal, and by living a life of faithfulness to the gospel covenant, which is obedience, living for Jesus. As we saw, justification in a narrow sense meant pardon and acceptance, but in a broader sense, justification includes membership in the new covenant, participation in the church as the body of Christ, union with Christ, and access or title to the eternal kingdom. The Anglican order of salvation, baptism, sanctification, final judgment, eternal glory, would continue to serve as the basic framework of Wesley's soteriology throughout his life. Likewise, the connection between justification and holy living finds its roots in Wesley's early period. Because in 17, beginning in 1725, Wesley came under the influence of Anglican holy living divines like Jeremy Taylor and William Law, who opened Wesley's eyes to see the necessity of inward holiness for, the re for renewal in the Imago Dei. But this also meant that holy living is necessary for final justification at the Last Judgment. Although Wesley would later learn to distinguish between justification and sanctification, the conviction that inward holiness is necessary for final salvation became permanently rooted in Wesley's soteriology at this time. And we see that in his writings throughout his life. Lastly, Wesley's early doctrine of justification finds its fullest expression in his devotional and sacramental writings. This is to be expected since he held a sacramental view of justification and the Christian life. It is in these writings that we learn that Wesley employed the economic trinity to expound his doctrine of justification, with the Father, Son, Holy Spirit having distinct roles for our pardon and redemption. The economic trinity would continue to serve as the skeleton structure upon which Wesley would build his soteriology. One of the best summaries of these roles and of Wesley's early understanding of justification is found in the closing doxology of the collection of forms of prayer. And I close with this prayer, with this blessing. Now to God the Father, who first loved us and made us acceptable in the Beloved. To God the Son, who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. To God the Holy Spirit, who sheddeth the love of God and broaden our hearts, be all love and all glory in time and to all eternity. Amen. God bless you.